Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I'm so excited to bring you this conversation that I've just had with Ellen Vaughn, who is a New York Times bestselling author. She co-wrote the Jesus Revolution book with Greg Laurie. Uh, but we're going to talk about today is her authorized biography of Elizabeth Elliot. So that has come in two volumes. I've read the first volume. The second volume has just come out, and I am so excited to read it. But I am so excited for you to hear this conversation because there is so much depth and richness to it. Uh, Ellen, of course, researched Elizabeth's life, had access to all of her personal journals going all the way back to when Elizabeth was a little girl. And if you're unfamiliar with Elizabeth's story, we start the podcast. That's one of the highlights for me. We start the podcast with Ellen recounting the story that we all sort of know about Elizabeth Elliot. And then we go into a part of her life that isn't as public. Not a lot of people actually know about um, this, this sort of second half of her life. We all kind of know her as this hero who went into the tribe who had killed her husband and shared the gospel with them. But there was a lot that happened in her life after that, including two more marriages. And so we talk about that today. And uh, of course, Ellen writes a lot about that more deeply in the book uh, called Being Elizabeth Elliot. So I just highly recommend these autobiographies. The first one is called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot, and then there's Being Elizabeth Elliot. And I think that the good, bad, and ugly of Elizabeth's life has a lot to teach us as modern Christians today. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Here's Ellen Vaughn. Well, Ellen, so glad to have you on the podcast. As we were chatting about off air just a few minutes ago, I absolutely loved your first volume of the biography of the life of Elizabeth Elliot. And I'd love for you to catch our viewers and listeners mm -hmm. up on and the life of Elizabeth. I, I assume there's some people, maybe some of our younger listeners who are unfamiliar <laughs> with what happened in her life and why that was so inspiring for, I think, many people in my generation. I grew up in the, you know, I you know, was born in 75, so I'm growing up in the 80s, 90s. It was just mm -hmm. hugely influential in my life. So, so tell us a little bit about Elizabeth mm -hmm. and what drew you to her story. Sure. I appreciate that. Uh, I find that boomers, people my age, and I'm a generation older than you, right? And so I uh, tend to know Elizabeth Elliot. She was one of our evangelical icons. Everyone knew her story, but I'm finding, of course, that millennials and Gen Zs and others are like, who was Elizabeth Elliot and why should I care? Right. And so part of what I really wanted to do in writing these books of her, her authorized biography was to introduce her to people who's, for whom her story is not familiar. And just a thumbnail sketch of it, because this was a gutsy lady. And in the uh, second half of the 20th century, Elizabeth Elliot was a young, idealistic college student who wanted to be a missionary. And she goes off to Ecuador, to the wilds of the Amazon jungle. And uh, she there marries her true love, Jim Elliot. And so they are ministering among the indigenous people in the jungle there. And uh, they and four other couples with whom they were working developed this real sense of, oh, my goodness, there is an unreached people group deeper in the jungle. They're called the Waodani. And we really feel like they need to have a chance to, to hear the good news of the gospel because this tribe was a Stone Age tribe. They uh, did not wear clothes. They uh, had no conflict resolution, so they would settle out uh, differences by spearing one another to death, okay? So they had a 70% homicide rate. Seven wow. out of 10 of them died by, by spearing. And so they lived in this cycle of, of fear and darkness and, and untouched by, by the world, but it was not a good thing. And so... Uh, Elizabeth and Jim and the other couples really prayed, Lord, give us an entree to go to this people group. And it's a longer story that I tell in volume one of Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's biography. But um, after much prayer and some preparations and initial, uh, an initial friendly kind of response from, from the tribal people, Jim and the four other guys went in and all four of them were speared to death. Their bodies just left on the beach. And so Elizabeth, at age 28, had a 10-month-old child and found herself a widow. 
And so her story, I think, was powerful for people of my generation because here was this woman and she prayed a very unlikely prayer. She said, Lord, if you want me to do anything about the Waodani, about the unreached people, I'm available. And I think that's such a, a great prayer about anything. Lord, if yeah. I'm available. And so through some pretty surprising things, Elizabeth and her little daughter, Valerie, went and lived among the tribal people who had slaughtered her husband and friends. And the Waodani, because they saw this, this forgiveness, rather than continuing the cycle of revenge and murder and killing, they began to learn about the one who was speared for them. They began to learn about who Jesus was. And Elizabeth initially did not speak the language. She wasn't there preaching eloquent sermons about the love of Christ. She came and lived among them. And I love that because it's what Jesus did for us. He incarnational ministry. He came and dwelt among us. And so not a whole lot of young women in the 1950s were doing things like that. And then Elizabeth came home. Eventually, she wrote a number of books. She was on speaking circuits around the world 300 days a year. And she became one of the few women with a public voice in the, the evangelical space. And so she was a, a great thinker. She was, a, a, as I've said several times, a gutsy woman. And I think someone whose story had intrigued me from the time I was young. So I was anxious to delve deeper in and, and find out more of her story. I love it. And let's talk about you for a moment before we get into, because you've got the second volume coming out, which I've been waiting for and so excited to. I haven't gotten a chance to dig in yet, but I've got it. Um, but let's talk about you. I know that, um, I mean, it takes, I can't even fathom the amount of time mm -hmm. it would take to research something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to ask you about that in a moment. But first, tell us a little more about you and what you related with in her story that would provide such a drive to to go so deep to uh, commit so much time and energy into into creating these two volumes like mm. this. Mm. Well, I was a a nerdy little kid who loved to read books all the time, who wanted to be a writer when she grew up. So I was that kid. And then in my family of origin, my parents were uh, very hospitable and our house was always the house in the local church where missionaries on furlough came and, and stayed when they were visiting the United States. And our dinner table was, was often full of people who were telling stories of, of faraway places and about what God was doing in some really unlikely ways. And that always intrigued me. I was intrigued by the writings of C.S. Lewis and by the stories of, of, of believers going into places that were, were very remote and the power of the Holy Spirit in those places. So that, that was what fueled me into a writing life. I'm very curious. I love stories. I feel like the, the Bible is, is the, the meta narrative. It is the big story. And I'm always intrigued by how does, how does God intersect with each of us? whether we live in the, the jungles of the Amazon or in New York City. And so that's what led me to become a writer. And then when I was approached about writing Elizabeth's biography, I thought, yeah, this is something to, to get my teeth into. I love it. And it's an authorized biography. Is that, is that correct? Right, right. And so there's a cute little sticker on the front that says authorized. <laughs> and, and all that means is that uh, the because anyone can write a biography of anyone, and that would be an unauthorized biography. But authorized means that the, the people who were entrusted by Elizabeth kind of with the legacy of her story um, came to me and, and to my surprise and, and uh, wanted me to be really the steward of the story. And that does not mean that they wanted this, this you know, lovely sort of whitewashed story. They, I had full permission to write the truth as I saw it, and I have. Yeah. But what it meant for me is that I had access to all of her, her journals. Elizabeth kept journals from the time she was 11 years old. There's a journal written entirely in pencil, and it says, no boys allowed on the front. And wow. Then, there are journals all through her life, through World War II and in the jungle. And then when Jim is killed and her loneliness and, and 
then back in the States and, and the, the pages unfolding of another human being's most intimate experiences. Mm. And wow. Elizabeth could appear to be a very remote and formidable woman, if you saw her <laughs> on a speaking platform. Not the kind of person you really want to cozy up to. That was her public persona. But in the journals, you see the passionate flesh and blood human being, the woman. And I found that the Elizabeth of the journals was someone I could relate to. Mm. And so I tried to bring out as much of that as possible in the book, because I think that's what we all enjoy is reading about a relatable character, uh, yeah. a hero who has plenty of flaws and warts like all of us. Yeah. So do you think those journals will ever be published for the public? <laughs> I, I don't. Well, they are not mine, and and yeah. so that is the decision of the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation. Yeah, but I I don't know that there would be plans for that in the near future. And so yeah. I've been very judicious. I mean, there's a lot more I could have put in if I wanted to be salacious or sort of a tell-all type of thing, and I tried to reveal things about Elizabeth in the intimacy of her journals, but to also show respect for things that I think she probably would not want uh, mm. revealed. I think what it has done for me is I realize because I'm one of those journal people, I need to like burn my journals before I die. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. I was just thinking like, hmm, I wonder yeah. if she meant for yeah. all of that. So that that's neat that you are trying to be respectful of what she would probably be okay with people knowing about her in those yeah. sort of intimate yeah thoughts that she had. So what's involved with researching an autobiography, or not auto, a biography? I mean, how many years did you research? Tell us a little bit about that process. Well, uh, again, she was a prolific writer. You've got all those journals, dozens and dozens, and little tiny handwriting. Some of them I had to look at literally using like a magnifying glass. I felt like an archaeologist, you know, <laughs> very time consuming masses of, of personal letters. She also has archives at Wheaton College at the Billy Graham Center there. But um, I had a truckload of stuff that Valerie Elliott, who was the little girl that Elizabeth carried on her back into the jungle, that um, Val and her husband brought to my house. So I had all of these private papers, as well as, of course, access to all the the papers that, that anyone um, can get access to. So it was slow going. And then the, the joy of being able to interview her family, her friends, uh, people who knew her well. And then I went to Ecuador and I uh, went deep into the Amazon and I took a tiny little plane that looked like a bumblebee and flew over the jungle and landed on a tiny little landing strip. And then we were taken by canoe and then we trekked through the jungle and then we came to the settlement of the Waodani today. Wow. And so for me, it was important to, to what did it smell like? What did it feel like? What did it look like? And obviously different from Elizabeth's experiences in the 1950s, but in order to really get in her head, I wanted to experience that piece of her life because it was so central to who she was both as a young woman, but also, of course, over the years. Wow. Is that, would you have flown into Quito or? Well, I flew into Quito and then you uh, uh, went down to Shell and that's kind of the gateway to the great Eastern jungle of the Amazon. And then uh, I don't know where I was, believe me. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to go to Quito several times on a mission trip and I'm just yeah. sort of realizing like, the influence of her and uh, Jim's life there too, because they would the, the missionaries there were, would talk about her and and so yeah. forth. That's really cool. So yeah. okay, so the the you've decided to break her um, story into two volumes. Why why did you do that? And because I know with what we read in volume one, a lot of that stuff, that's the story we all know, right? That's kind of the mm -hmm. Elizabeth we're all familiar with. But mm -hmm. in volume two, you go into sort of this new f next phase of her life. Talk about why you decided to break it into two parts and what you tend to focus on in the second part.
Well, we're taking a quick break from our conversation with Ellen Vaughn to talk to you about our first sponsor today, and that is Carly Jean Los Angeles. This is a small Los Angeles-based clothing line that I love so much. It was founded by Carly Brannon. She's a mom of four. She's a Christian. She's pro-life. And I love the clothes. I'm in a season of life where I just really don't have the time or mental energy to go to the mall, try on a bunch of stuff, only to come home disappointed. I know that when I order from Carly Jean, the clothes, they're always just so cute and they're very versatile. They go well together. And I like that they're simple enough that you can dress them up if I want to look a little bit more dressy for an event, but I can also dress them down if I need to be a little more casual. I'm almost always wearing at least one Carly Jean piece every day. I just absolutely love this company. I love the ethics. I love that their basics line is made right here in the USA. And the other lines that aren't made in the USA are made by people who have relationship with the company. These are uh, ethical and healthy work environments. I love that. So if you want to check out Carly Jean, go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com and you can use my code ALISA for 20% off your first order. Again, that's CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use my code ALISA for 20% off your first order. Right. And so for me, every book is, um, first of all, an experience in neuroticism. It's like, oh, I can't write this. I need to go get a job at Starbucks. I can't do it. Right. But then also the book kind of tells you what it needs to be. Initially, I was going to write one volume. And then I realized there is far too much material for one volume. And so uh, the volume one, as you said, is sort of the story that for which she is best known. But then volume two is is the middle part of her life. And I think it's the most interesting part of her life. It is as she comes back to the U.S. and it's in the tumultuous 1960s when when people are marching in the streets and, and throwing off conventional morality and all of this. And Elizabeth is really, in a sense, in the 1960s, when this book starts, volume two, she's a rebel. And, and she is not marching in the streets, but she is very concerned with, Lord, show me what, what is the gospel? What is a relationship with you really about? And what are the trappings of religion? What are the cultural pieces that we put on faith mm. as North Americans? And that's, a, of course, a, a really important question, not just for someone who had been ministering among completely different culture in Ecuador, but, but for all of us today. And I really was drawn to Elizabeth's questioning in the early years of this book, Volume 2, because I think it's, it's what many are questioning today mm. in this very polarized culture in which we live what is what is religion? Which is what is churchianity, and what is the the gospel that Jesus came to live and be and share with us, and what does that look like played out in the public square? What does mm. that look like in my personal life? And so I loved Elizabeth kind of working through those types of issues in her inimitable style. She was such a clear thinker, and. Um, so I found that very interesting. And then I knew very little about Elizabeth's second husband. We always hear about Jim Elliott, right? Right. And, uh, their courtship and, and then his, his early death. And uh, so Elizabeth married in middle age and she fell head over heels, passionately, crazily, much to her shock, in love. And uh, married a, a seminary professor and writer, her intellectual equal named Addison Leach. And it was a, a passionate love story. And the Elizabeth in that story is someone I barely even recognized. Oh, wow. You know, because she's overflowing. Yeah, she is. It was probably the most joyful time of her life. She didn't seem to have a big talent for joy. <laughs> mm. And so... Uh, this season it is beautiful and it's so surprising. Yeah. And then slowly, inevitably, horrifically, he develops a little growth. Oh Lord, please don't let it be cancer. It's cancer. And bit by bit by bit, he, he is just taken down by that terrible disease. And then Elizabeth 
walking through the valley of the shadow with her husband, knowing what's coming. Jim Elliott was taken very quickly, but this was slow and it was agonizing. And how she deals with the grieving, how she deals with questions of faith, I think resonate with, with anyone who has experienced yeah. loss of any kind. And I found that a very uh, intimate and, and arduous part of the book mm. uh, to write. But I think it has so many nuggets of really of gold that you find only in times of great suffering, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So I'd love to to ask you more about that because you mentioned even in, in the journal saying, Lord, don't let it be cancer. And then, of course, how mm-hmm. does Elizabeth Elliot deal with unanswered prayer? I assume you read <laughs> many of her unanswered prayers and, and how she responds mm-hmm. to the Lord in those moments. Well, I think Elizabeth was a person who was absolutely determined that her faith would not she would not determine the strength of her faith by how she felt, okay? Mm. And she was was very suspicious of emotions and uh, very, what I like also about this second volume, the period that it covers, is she was much more willing to embrace mystery. She grew up in an evangelical environment where there was an answer to every question. You know, usually with a proof text and a verse, and and this is this is what we say when people ask this. In the and in this season of her life, she's she's saying, Lord, there, I don't understand. I, I it kind of like Job's prayer, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. And she felt in the wrenching loss of her second husband, like she was being slain. That, that the love that God had given in such a sweet and unlikely way was being snatched away. And so you'll need to read the book to see piece by piece her journey. But uh, she became, I don't know that we ever become comfortable with unanswered questions and unanswered prayers. Lord, this is a good thing. Why do you deny it? But that's all of our experience. Yeah. And... There has to come a time in our journey of faith where we say, Lord, you are good, and I trust you regardless of whatever outcomes I experience. Mm. I can see why you... Oh, go ahead, please. So Sorry, I'm I'm just ranting now. But um, to me, that feels like it's so important because I feel like many in the church today, many Christians, we've subconsciously, we would never do this consciously, but we've come into this sort of outcome-based hope. Yeah. You know, my hope is in the Lord and that that outcome X will happen. And when that doesn't happen, what does faith look like? Right. And for me, I've had to wrestle with that quite a bit. At the time I was writing about the death of Addison Leach, as much as I could, I put Elizabeth Elliot's skin on and mm-hmm. and immersed in those journals and living that experience I had not had. And as God would have it, literally, a few days after I wrote that section of the book, my husband was taken to the emergency room. My Mm. husband was diagnosed with a malignant, aggressive, inoperable, horrific brain tumor that would take his life. And it did a few weeks later. And so the the resonance between sort of walking that journey vicariously with Elizabeth and then me in real time seeing the disintegration and the death of my own much loved husband who I've been married to for 38 years. So it was, we had had a wonderful um, time together, but I felt very robustly comforted. It is a mystery. And do I trust you or do I not? This is not the outcome we prayed for. Mm, yeah. But it is all right. It is all right. I so appreciate all those thoughts. I, you know, it's almost like this kind of transactional approach to faith that we can yeah. have sometimes. Yeah. And I even realized that 
I don't know how this was happening because it wasn't on purpose, but even my own kids, when we would teach them about prayer, I remember my son, when he was really little, just saying, well, I don't want to pray because it doesn't work. And mm-hmm. I realized like, oh, goodness, he, he's somehow caught this idea that it's mm-hmm. it's an exchange. It's like you give God something, he gives you back. You send up a prayer, he sends down an answer. And so right. we've really tried, my husband and I have really tried to approach that much differently from that point on and just saying, look, you don't want something to come true. Like to, you don't want what you're asking for if it's not what God wants for you. And mm-hmm. just having to trust the Lord in those hard times. I appreciate you sharing that about your own experience. I wonder if even walking through that, um, if there was maybe a specific entry of Elizabeth's that really ministered to you or that you kept coming back to in those times, or maybe even a thought or a sentiment. All right. Well, I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Ellen Vaughn. I want to take a moment to tell you about our second sponsor for today. And this is one of our newer sponsors that I'm very excited about. And that is Seven Weeks Coffee. I love everything about this company, A, because they are pro-life and they're so pro-life that 10% of all the orders go to pregnancy resource care centers all over the country. And they have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to these pro-life pregnancy care centers. I love that. That's why in the ad, it says... This is the coffee that Planned Parenthood hates, and that's one reason to absolutely love it. You can become a member of the Heartbeat Club. I actually became a member of the Heartbeat Club this week. Of course, we know at seven weeks, the baby is about the size of a coffee bean, and we can detect a heartbeat. If you join the Heartbeat Club, it's a subscription service. You can get coffee every month, super easy to manage online. You can change your order. uh, so You can modify your subscription. You can cancel at any time, and it's just wonderful coffee. No pesticides. Great high standards, shade grown, uh, direct trade. I love it. Mold free. Just so great. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com. You can use my code ALISA for 10% off any order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use my code ALISA for 10% off any order. Well, you know, it would be great if I could say yes. And here, I've got it right here. Let me read it to you. But (laughs) I guess I felt more prepared for my own journey than Elizabeth did for hers. Mm. And so in hers, I saw a lot more um, putting her hope maybe in the next treatment or the next thing that, uh, that maybe someone could go to Mexico and get a substance that you couldn't get in the U.S. And maybe that would help heal Addison. And I understand that, you know, the cancer journey is horrible. But for me, maybe I had the gift of clarity. It was so clear that this was Lee's ticket home, my husband. Mm. And so it was acceptance of, am I going to rely on what I know to be true about eternity? Or do I want to try to be comfortable in this life? Mm. You know, kind of come up with a patchwork, you know, thing that'll make me feel better now. And I feel like, I don't know, I think I'm a very practical person. And so... There was a sense of, I I don't get it, I hate it, but it is well with my soul because mm. this is this is not the end, this yeah. is not all there is. Those prayer requests, you know, maybe like what you said about your son, the things that he may be praying for are great things, you know, and yeah. we don't we don't know why God wouldn't grant them. But sometimes it's as if my peace of mind depends on me figuring out why. Mm. And so actually that is a resonance with Elizabeth. She found that why is an unnecessary question. Mm. Why is an unnecessary question? I guess Mm. that, boy, that really makes sense. Because if you are trusting the Lord fully and truly knowing that he's sovereign over creation, Mm -hmm. then the why is a lot less important when you think about it from that eternal perspective. That's really good. That's really. Did right, you ever right. get to meet Elizabeth in real life? I did in real life, uh, various times when I was much younger. As a um, trying to think, not as a student, but as a young professional person, she sometimes would worship in the church where I worshipped when she would come to Washington D.C. And uh, when I was working at Prison Fellowship with Chuck Colson, she came, I remember, one day to do uh, to speak to the staff. And uh, so I had various t- interactions with her in those those types of settings. Wow. But no, so, we didn't sit down and have a heart to heart. 
And it's funny because in the journal, she will say, oh, I pity the poor biographer who will be reading <laughs> this. And, and um, I'm like, here I am. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You like take a little joy in that. <laughs> That's so right, cool. Right. Wow. So right. what is your impression of her before you did all this research and were, were given access to her journals? Did your impression of her change or your um, just how you kind of perceived her? Well, I had per- I think most people perceived Elizabeth Elliot as rather remote and stern and severe and intimidating. And uh, she she was a very disciplined woman and she held herself in such a way that she was not approachable at all. Yeah. And she knew that about herself. But um, I, I admired her. I didn't necessarily like her a whole lot. And then as I said, the Elizabeth I found in the journals is a much more um, flesh and blood likable person. Mm. And so I I found her relatable. In real life, if one would see Elizabeth on a platform, or I've talked to so many people who stood in book lines for her to sign their book. Yeah. And she was rude. Yeah. And, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and, and I, she would bewail in her journals her own lack of social skills. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah, but she just, she was a very private person. And and sometimes it was just hard for her to connect. Yeah. That's so funny you would say that because a friend of mine had stood in line at a book at a book signing of Elizabeth's. Yeah. And I was like, what was it like? Was, you know, she goes, well, she, she was kind of you know, very, very short and kind of cold. It was like, yeah. wow. That, I mean, I don't know what I would have expected, but yeah, I, I remember you said in the first volume something like she she wasn't very, she wasn't fussy. She was just sort of like no nonsense and just, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, uh, like you said, you didn't see that vulnerability there. That's very interesting. Right. She, she was also fascinating to me in that she was so ambitious and driven and mm-hmm prolific, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. and yet totally not a feminist. There was this sort of anti-feminism quality about her. And I wonder if there's something that you could point out even in her life or or even in this second volume that might be sort of the antithesis of this modern feminism or maybe something modern women need to need to read. What what would you speak to on that? (laughs) Well, it's interesting because as I was trying to write this book, there's so much material and you want it to have a narrative arc. You want it to be a story that people will enjoy reading. Okay. And here's the thing. Elizabeth wrote what? 25 books. She, uh, she had countless articles. And so her material on her views on feminism in the seventies and the books that she wrote subsequent to that time about womanhood and masculinity, all of those things. I felt I kind of in the book didn't, I didn't go to those topics because anyone who wants to know what she thought can read her books. Yeah. And I didn't want the bio to become like a rehash of her views on different things. That wouldn't be very interesting reading. And I know in the 70s, what I did include was some of her, she would mourn over the people who broke fellowship with her because mm. of her views. There were people with whom she had been rather close in the the Christian feminist movement. And then as as um, both of their views solidified more and more, there was a division. And Elizabeth mourned over that, over wow. the, the loss of relationship. She felt like uh, she was a lonely voice uh, speaking out in terms of her view of of male and female roles. And she felt like it was her, if people hated her because of it, so be it. Mm. So wow. in the book, I focus more on on the narrative and the person behind the views, not the views themselves. Right. So what do you think modern women could learn or why should they read about her life? Well, I uh, I hold some different views than she did in terms of those those. Mm -hmm. Um, gender roles. And certainly I do not agree with her view of submission. I think it, she went through a lot that I expose very gently in this book because of that. But uh, I think that she, 
she questioned a lot. Um, and I think that there, here's a person who came to some different conclusions than I would, but I so respected her process. Mm. Okay. And again, I think the overarching thing for Elizabeth that I admire a lot is that it wasn't how do I feel or how am I being my best self now or how am I fulfilled? It was about, Lord, how do I follow you? What have you said about this? And, and there, there is a straight edge to her determination to follow Christ that I think is sometimes missing among many in our very egocentric, feeling-centric culture. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, of believers have kind of subconsciously maybe adopted some of, of those, those feelings. Yeah. So without giving the whole book away, can you share a little bit about what her specific view of submission was and then maybe where you might differ with her? Well, I think that um, I'll let the, the book speak for itself. Um, I decided to, in this book, just to tell the story of the middle section of her life. And to the book ends about the time of her third marriage. And so the story there from the beginning of this project, I had been told by Elizabeth's intimate friends about issues in her third marriage that I had no idea about. I'm an innocent biographer thinking, oh, this will be easy. No, it wasn't easy. (laughs) And there were things that her, she, in her public persona, you would never know that she was dealing with at home that were very, very difficult, very controlling. Mm. And So I will let what I've chosen to say in the book about that stand for itself. But I felt like my charge in that was to to speak the truth in love, to divulge some of the realities of that third marriage, but not in a condemning way. Elizabeth was not perfect. Certainly her third husband was not. I'm not, you're not, you know. And so we all have our, our blind spots and the areas in our lives that that we would shudder if anyone was to to focus on. But I think that Elizabeth could have had a very different trajectory in her public writing and speaking if she had made a different choice Mm. um, just at the eve of that third marriage. Interesting. And she believed that it was the biggest mistake of her life, but she didn't dwell in that. Once it was done, she, uh, as always, committed, how do I follow the Lord in this? Mm -hmm. And um, I've interviewed and been with her third husband. I care for him. And uh, and, uh, he has come to know Jesus, and that is a good thing. All right, taking a quick break to tell you about another one of our sponsors, and that is Good Ranchers, one of my favorite companies. It's American meat delivered right to your door, and this has simplified my life so much because I really care about the quality of the food that I feed my family. And so you have heritage breed pork, you have pastured, um, better than organic chicken, and uh, beef with no antibiotics, hormones, or vaccinations. This is the best quality meat you can buy, and it comes right to your door. I love to gather my family around the table for dinners as often as we can, but what I don't like to do is plan ahead and stress about what I'm going to do. So on any given day, I can just pull the meat out of the freezer and base my meal around that, and it's ready to go. And then my family's gathered together around the table. November is a great month to try Good Ranchers. If you've been on the fence and you're like, I don't know, maybe you want to give it a try in November because they have a great uh, promotion running as a part of their Black Friday sale that will run through the end of the month of November. So you get to pick one year of free protein. So you get your choice. You can choose from top sirloin steaks, salmon, chicken breast, or bacon. You can get that free for a year. That's like a $500 value. Plus, you're going to get $15 off. And that's when you go to goodranchers.com and use my code ALISA. Again, go to goodranchers.com, use my code ALISA to get $15 off your order. And also, you can choose between top sirloin steaks, salmon, chicken breast, or bacon free for a year. Goodranchers.com, use my code ALISA. Uh, of all the seasons of her life, as you've done the research for this book, which is the one that you resonated the most with? 
That's a great question. I would have to think about it for <laughs> a moment because uh, I think it would be the, the section that this um, volume two is focused on when I write about him being Elizabeth Elliot, because um, I'm at a season of life. You're not there yet and your listeners are not there, but where, where you're looking back more and there's a certain comfort in your own skin. That's the only advantage to getting older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That I can think of, but just a sense of, oh, Lord, your, your grace is so, so good to all of us in this bumpy, crazy, messed up journey. And um, so I think when Elizabeth was, was in that section of her life where she was really seeking to write books that, that caused people to really think, she wasn't just playing to her audience, which maybe mm. is a little bit of what she did later on. But in, in the 60s and 70s, are, she wrote some of my favorite of her books because she was probing, she was thinking, she was questioning, and she was very adventurous. And I love that. Mm. What, what's your favorite book she wrote and why? Well, there's a little known book that Elizabeth wrote, her only novel. It's called No Graven Image. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. Well, it it uh, it didn't, you know, burn down the bookstore, so to speak. But <laughs> uh, it is uh, it's a story about a mission, a young female missionary, not unlike Elizabeth Elliot, and what she confronts on the mission field, and how it it seismically shifts her view of God. Hmm. And the title of the book, I think, is really it's an insight into Elizabeth Elliot. Because Elizabeth believed that so easily our religious um, structures, um, our, our, our religious heroes, and she became one to many evangelicals, mm -hmm. but our heroes can become graven images. They mm -hmm. can become idols. And so the title of the book and its content really have to do with not putting anything chief in our affections, even if it's succeeding in wonderful ministry, even if it's doing great work for the kingdom of God and having many followers and many donors and all of that. No, it is about who is God, not the sense of I want to, of, of holding up this image of him. Mm. And so I think that's a, it's a, a difficult topic. It's certainly not a perfect book. There is no such thing, but but I love that she she dealt with that, mm. and so in 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 my book uh, becoming or what is it being Elizabeth Elliot, I um, I covered the period of her writing that because I think it's a as I said a great insight into how she thought. Love that. As a writer, I, I would imagine it would have been interesting. You know, you have access to her published books, which mm -hmm. had, you know, editing and all of this, you know, the smoothing and the mm -hmm. polishing. And then you're reading her raw journals. How much of a difference was there? Did, what kind of a writer was she in her journals? Was it more sporadic or was it more eloquent, like what we would read in one of her books? How did that hit mm -hmm. you? Yeah, she was a natural writer. You know, Elizabeth had no ghost writer in the back, right? I mm -hmm. mean, she... Her journals are beautiful. They're beautifully ex expressed. There is hardly ever a cross out, um, mm. particularly when she's young. Her handwriting just flows, flows, flows down the page. And she creates these images where you can see where she is. She was a, a beautiful and writer. And she would always um, really just, just grieve. And she was pretty neurotic herself about the writing process. I can't do this. I can't, I can't write this article. I can't write this book. Uh, so it was difficult like it is for most writers for her to grind it out, mm. but she had such keen powers of observation and that made her writing really, uh, it has a sense of immediacy of concreteness. I can see that in my head because she includes specific sensory details. And then, as you know, she was such a clear thinker that when she is putting forth an argument or a line of thought, it's compelling. Yeah. So wow. I think that, it, she was a good writer. Yeah. And that's very comforting because as I've written, it's like everything I agree to write, I'm always like, why did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I did, 
why did I do that? I don't want to do this. And I don't know. I I really struggle with writing a lot, especially with the books. It's like halfway through, I'm like, let's just give the money back. Never mind. Why did did we do this? So that's comforting to know (laughs) that it's, Yeah. 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 You're normal. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there we go. So what would you say, um, oh gosh, I can't even fathom taking on, I mean, what what an absolute just behemoth to tackle this. this um, is this going to be three volumes all said and done, or is it, is it just going to be two? I believe it's just going to be these two. These two, okay. I think, I think it's good. It's what enough. was the most challenging part of this for you? Uh, probably the most challenging part was as I encountered things I had not anticipated was how to speak the truth in love. Mm. This truth was about how, her, right? Right. The truth about right. her, yeah. And, and, and others. And so, you know, it's a, it's a very heavy stewardship to be the biographer, mm. to, to, to be given, um, and, you know, in this case, the family's, you know, um, unction to to go ahead and 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 write their loved one's story and uh so i i held that very carefully and very prayerfully and uh so i i talk about that a fair amount in one of the early chapters of the book and and i was very much helped along by elizabeth herself because she wrote two biographies and uh in in those biographies she writes explicitly about the burden the unique mm. burden the biographer faces of what do you make of this person? Who was he really? Who was she really? And how does any, how well does anyone know another person ever? I mean, she would get very much into all of the psychology of, you know, how do we write biographies? It's impossible. And um, so at one of the last lines of the book, I quote her, I thought her own words would be the best way to close it out in that this is what one person could discover about another. Mm. May the reader draw the conclusions that he or she wills. Oh, that's good. That's very mm-hmm. good. So I want to swing back to something you mentioned earlier, because I just wanted to know if you could go a little deeper into it. You called Elizabeth mm-hmm. a rebel. And mm-hmm. I, I think that we're sort of living in a time where mm-hmm. being faithful to Jesus, being faithful to the Christian life, you're now the rebel. And in, in, in some kind of a way, she was too. I wonder if you could talk more about that, Elizabeth, as the rebel and why you chose that word for her. Right. Well, I chose the world word because it was often used in the time period, which was the 60s, early 70s. And I think that she was a rebel against conventional Christian thinking. She was a rebel against some of these structures in the evangelical culture that were that uh, were not questioned. And she uh, was the person always asking the hard questions in meetings. Mm. She found herself one of the few, most of the time, the only female voice at the table, okay? Uh, she was uh, one of the very few female speakers who was asked to, to take on big scale speaking engagements. And uh, that can seem a bit ironic, given some of her later uh, yeah. stances about feminism. But but she was she was really breaking through some of the male hierarchy that she saw as silly in in the conventional Christianity that was coming out of the 1950s, 60s. Yeah. It was a very different time period than we're in today. And so what I liked, again, is that she was rebelling against conventional thinking. This mm. is what Christians think. Can and you give us an stay- example of one of those? Like, what would one of those have been? Oh, the first thing that popped in my head is sort of a silly example. But um, uh, might as well go with it because um, otherwise I'll just draw a blank, right? <laughs> but um, so uh, things that were real, uh, that were kind of common Christian thought in the 50s, like Christians uh, don't drink and they don't dance and they don't do this. They're defined by what they don't do, Mm. not what they do. Uh, We don't talk about Christians, oh, the most loving and fun people you'd ever want to be around. No, it's what they don't do, right? Mm. And so um, Elizabeth, you know, again, grew up in a a very um, legalistic sort of home of origin. Her mom's visiting one time, her elderly mother. And um, 
so Elizabeth is talking about how she doesn't see how, why we, there should be compunctions about drinking wine. And um, so at any rate, I'll, I'll leave the reader to read the book to see that exchange between Elizabeth and her mom. But to Elizabeth, that was an example of sort of just, uh, this is what we do because it's a cultural norm of our time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, she had a um, a friend who, oh, we don't allow the, the children to play Monopoly because it might incur uh, bring up in them the, the love of money. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. So, so she would those things sound very archaic and silly today, but she, she would question the norms. I don't know. It's an interesting question. What are we rebels today or are we perceived in secular culture as the people who still toe the line of all yeah. the things, you know, we were ever told that we're not thinking proactively. Yeah. I, I, I've often thought about what she might, mm -hmm. what her commentary would be if she were still alive Mm -hmm. uh, at evangelical culture today, I've, yes. I've often just kind of thought, like, what would she, what would her word be for the church today? And yeah. um, you know, it would be interesting to speculate right. that. But I think she would mourn a bit over because many feel like evangelicalism, as it once was, has has disintegrated. Right. Yeah, and certainly, I think where the origins of that term came from, it had it had a noble background that yes. of biblical. Uh, orthodoxy and uh, at the same time a heart for justice and mercy and doing works uh, of good in the yes. culture at large, both those things. And now evangelical to secularly minded people mostly means right wing exactly. political religious bigots. Yeah. And uh, I think that would Elizabeth would mourn over that, but I mm -hmm. think she would also think, well let's let's come up with a new word. Mm. Who are we? You know, as followers of Jesus, what is our voice today? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a fascinating conversation because mm -hmm. I've often thought about it. It's like depends on who you ask, because mm -hmm. when I say evangelical, I'm thinking what you mentioned, the, mm -hmm. you know, the commitment to the um, the cross, the, the authority mm -hmm. of the Bible, uh, acts of service, these kinds of things. And then today people just they just see like a MAGA hat and a gun locker, right? Right, right. <laughs> but then if you ask the average person, you know, they just came out with a study about the theological beliefs of evangelicals. And really, my understanding is it was just anyone who called themselves an evangelical. So some for some people, that really is just a cultural term. And so they, mm -hmm. they didn't even, you know, 50% didn't even believe in the deity of Jesus. It's like that, mm -hmm. that word is just so crazy. And I've heard some people say, well, if we come up with a new word, well, then that one will get ruined and we'll just have to come up with a <laughs> another one. So I don't know what's going to happen there, but that that's interesting. I would, I, I wish we could, we could hear her, what she would say or write about where we're at today, because there's, there seems to be sort of all this just erosion on all sides, but there's always the remnant, right? There's always mm -hmm. the people who are committed to, to Christ and, and being made <clears throat> more in his image every single day. And Elizabeth was right. certainly one of those people. And you mentioned as she got older that she embraced more mystery. I've experienced that in my life as well. It's, it's. Um, I mean, there are things that we don't need mystery, right? There are things where God has spoken and he's spoken clearly mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we ought not, you know, attach mystery to something that God has made clear. But um, I wonder, you know, you, you use this phrase, in, impenetrable mystery. So mm -hmm. what would be your hope for people as they read your book, how they could uh, maybe understand that impenetrable mystery even more in ourselves? Yes. Well, that's a big, that's an impenetrable question. Yeah. <laughs> that's really big. Uh, I think that for, for me, it, it, it really will depend on what the reader is experiencing in, in his or her life. Right. Mm. Because, um, you know, someone said uh, that we read books to know we're not alone. You know, mm. I love that. I love that there's a, when you pick up a book and you're reading about someone else's life, you connect on really the most uh, elemental parts of what it means to be a human being. And so if one is a human being of faith in, in, in God and in his son, Jesus Christ, then of course, the, it's interwoven with our own story, is the God story. And so I think that the impenetrable mystery uh, boils down to what we discussed a minute ago. I think it has to do with 
with uh, the areas in our lives where we cannot figure out why certain things have happened uh, or, or the age old question of human suffering. Why does God allow the suffer, suffering of the innocents in Ukraine? Why does God allow natural disasters that kill hundreds of thousands of people? Mm -hmm. All of the, 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 the horrors in the world today, that's part of the mystery of who God is. And I think for me, there's no way my human brain can understand that. I, I, I can't think in dimensions beyond the dimensions I already know, but God exists outside. He's in a quantum dimension that we can't even comprehend, right? Yeah. And outside of time. And so there is a certain throwing of my small self for Elizabeth throwing her small self into the arms of that God saying, you, you are other with a capital O. Yeah. I am small and I trust in you. And so I think the, maybe the problem with um, some of the views of evangelicals that we were talking about a second ago is that we're viewed as people who think there's always an answer. And mm. we give these, these sort of pat answers to everything. And I think that as we present as people who acknowledge with great horror and delight and, and truth the mysteries that we all experience as um, human beings, I think there's a certain freshness that comes into our, our then sharing of the gospel story. Hmm. Here's a God who entered into suffering. Yeah. Yeah. That's like unique among... Any other worldview? Like yes. where do you, where, what yep. other religion offers the suffering yes. of its own God, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, I think central to Elizabeth's story and why she's a worthy person to consider is the issue of suffering. Yeah. And she had suffering happen to her, things beyond her control frequently, but she also brought some of her own suffering on herself by her own decisions. Hmm. And God works in both. It's wow. intriguing. Yeah, that is. That is that's deep stuff there. What <laughs> what would you hope the reader would take away from reading Being Elizabeth Elliot? I hope the reader would have a rollicking good time reading the book. I would hope the reader laughs and cries and uh, sees things that are familiar, even though they come from the story of someone with whom we may not be familiar. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope that the reader feels stirred up inside. And when we get stirred up inside, then the Holy Spirit can move in us. Mm -hmm. And so the beautiful thing about writing a book is you and I, we do our labor, we feel paranoid, we, we do our thing to the best of our abilities, and we just offer it up to God. And then the word goes out, the story goes out, and then God, the Holy Spirit, will use it. It's not a perfect tool, but he will use it as he wills for different people in very individual ways. So that's my hope for yeah. the individual reader who reads this book. Very good. Well, what's up for what's up for you next? I know you worked on the Jesus Revolution book with Greg Laurie. You've done this mm -hmm. Elizabeth Elliot two-volume biography. What what are you working on next? Well, I it's fun because I feel like God brings me projects that I find intriguing. And so uh, like Elizabeth, I, I get quite a zest from international travel. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing a book now that um, uh, is just, I've come back recently from Rwanda and South Africa and India and Nepal with other travels to um places equally as far away, uh, coming up. And I'm writing about um, indigenous Christian leaders in some really tough, wow. oppressed, persecuted places and what mm. faith looks like in those contexts. Wow. And as a North American who lives a very comfortable life, I need those stories, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. And uh, I think perhaps other readers do too. So that's the book I'm doing now. It's associated with a ministry, International Cooperating Ministries. I sit on their board, and so I'm writing this book about the ministry. And then I have a, an authorized biography of a well-loved, more well-loved than Elizabeth Elliot, 
hmm. uh, evangelical hero. Oh, wow. So I guess we'll learn who that is in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very cool. Well, I look forward to both of those. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. This was great. Well, you're so kind. I've enjoyed talking with you and I wish you well. Thank you. Well, I want to thank my guest, Ellen Vaughn, for coming on and sharing her wisdom with us today and about the life of Elizabeth Elliot. Of course, I want to thank one of our sponsors, Southern Evangelical Seminary. You can go to ses.edu slash Elisa to find out all the reasons I love Southern Evangelical Seminary and why I will probably forever be a student there. And uh, as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. Mm